something really important. All right, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, basically, I wanted to prompt this call because I saw that there is so much activity happening and I feel that uh, it will be beneficial for us to jump on the call and kind of um, figure out where the, the spark leads us. Uh, so far for the past 10 days, the major driver of results has been just you know people jumping on calls, brainstorming and figuring out the next steps. And even though sometimes it feels like uh, there is no structure, there is no process, uh, it, there always, there is something and we, we somehow figure out where to proceed. So I'll let, uh, I guess, Hillary and John uh, kick off this, this meeting and just give their, their own insight and ideas about what we were talking about. Um, truthfully, there, it seems like there are a couple of directions that we're exploring. So I would love to, to get some more context. John, do you want to start with what your original idea was? And then we can kind of summarize where we went. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I was thinking that there are a lot of teams right now doing uh, high throughput screening work on compounds and drugs based on their understanding, mode of action, other antiviral stuff like that. But uh, we might be helpful in looking at drugs nobody's expecting would work in the existing patient population and the way to do that would be to take electronic medical records that are being generated now uh, by physicians treating patients and if we can get a survey out to patients who are being treated at a hospital so people who are at home who can tell us uh, their symptoms give us an idea of their uh, time of illness severity and prescription meds they are currently taking you know before they became infected we might hit on something useful. So I guess we should, we can start with the survey idea. I don't know if you saw our comments going back and forth, but um, we do have somebody who's experienced in writing root canner surveys. Uh, she's not on the call right now because she's busy, but she said she'd be working on it this weekend. I think one of the concerns someone brought up was about the potential legality problems in IRB. They will lose you guys. Sorry, I'm scrolling. I think it was it was Michael. I don't know if he's on the call. Yes, I'm here. Hey. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So the legal. I saw you have a comment about it being legally risky. I'm not sure of that. It it just sounds like something like I'm aware there's very strict laws governing soliciting uh, health information, even if it's self-reported. Um, I'm not sure how that applies to us because we're not a company or a healthcare provider or even a research institution. Um, it's just something that I think we should ask people before we we send something out. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, from from, that. from my experience, there is HIPAA regulation that is a is a major pain and like it's impossible to like to do and and go through it in a very quick manner but yeah as, since we're not a company there is no entity there is not necessarily a process for us to go through and yeah. as long as it's positioned as just you know some uh collaborative effort of individuals i think we could be fine with that except okay. there has to be again i'm not a lawyer i i don't have yeah, any neither. background on that and we may as well start posting on our social networks and whatever looking for medical lawyers to mm -hmm. help us uh, figure that out i think the more important issue besides the legalities of it is the actual infrastructure issue because it sounds like a good uh you know strategy to just uh, send out the survey to like physicians i guess and other people that are on the fr front lines right mm -hmm. uh, but what like what's the the physician won't be able to just dump all of the uh, of the data right sure. first of all there is ehr system that holds all of that data it's already hipaa protected there is no way to just export that and we don't want to do that because there is sensitive information and personal information for us to integrate with any of these solutions. That's going to be a, a lot of time. Um, even though I spoke to a company that I have connection to, 
which is uh, a company that is currently creating uh, an infrastructure for a hospital, uh, just one in the U.S., to uh, create a diagnostic tool for COVID-19. So, you know, working with smaller startups could be a way to to figure this out, but they're all overwhelmed. They're trying to, you know, build these tools and not sure they will have resources to do that. So in my head, the large scale integration is almost impossible. Uh, but if, we, if we're if we talking about the integration on the individual level, what would that be? And like just wrapping our heads around, let's say that we have a connection to physician in New York in a, you know, on the front line, and he's observing uh, tens of hundreds uh, patients and he has some some data about it. What's the efficient way to extract that from it? Yeah, so right now the typical process is the physicians will write notes and they'll pass it to like a unit secretary who then uploads the data to an electronic medical record and then that gets sent to CDC. So I did find a contact at CDC that has access to all of that data and I reached out, it was kind of a cold call. I don't know if she's actually gonna to respond to me in a timely fashion. Um, but on that point, how you said that the physicians are overwhelmed, CDC is reporting only five to 6% of the data they're getting is actually good thorough data. So one of the task parts that's kind of branching off this is we need to figure out a way to get that info, as you said, from the physician into some kind of database. So I'm pretty comfortable that we can create that database in like a matter of two days just from observing how fast people are accomplishing stuff. The question is really the logistics of communication and making sure that we have people that, that can actually use it or whether it's CDC personnel or uh, physicians or whoever. Right. So maybe like... Uh, I assume that the person at CDC, um, let's try and figure out if we have the organic connection to them through the network of our people. I mean, we're 600 people now. I'm pretty sure like there, there's gotta be some people that have connections. Maybe you can uh, share a contact with me and potential messaging or something of how you think that we should approach that person and we can try and facilitate it. Uh, we can't hear you. Something was the microphone. Sorry. I'm mumbling. Just ignore me. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay. So that's, that's one of the things that we brought up. Um, mm -hmm. But that's more like external, right? Like we can't really do anything until we get this data right. or access to that data. Uh, yep. The second point is what can we actually do given the current giant data set and potential things we can extract from it? Yeah, so I don't know if this was already done by another group because this seems like, it sounds like you guys can do this, you computer smart people. Um, <laughs> Honestly, we can do everything. Like, it's just amazing how much people are accomplishing, but the hardest problem is actually defining the problem. Okay, so here's my like fantasy ideal world, you know, thing that I would love to see is if we can go through these 45,000 plus papers and congeal the data set into some kind of, like in my brain, it's like an Excel spreadsheet where one column is like age and one is geographic area and one is, comorbidities and one is severity and one is outcomes, et cetera. And then if I went in there and I wanted to filter it to see, um, is New York doing better than Chicago or some kind of analysis like that, just kind of a big, I don't know. So you were talking about quantitative data, right? The actual numbers and values. I guess, yeah. Yeah, I guess we could have all of it there so that people can look at what they want. We may not be able to imagine what questions they're going to ask. So the more we can get out of there and then can, put... Can we try to re reformulate this as one of those sub questions? Let's imagine that this system exists, right? And you're able to just scan through it and filter and whatnot. And the things that you just mentioned sound like the problems that we can try and solve. Like, is New York doing better than uh, Los Angeles or any other city 
which is more of like uh, what task uh, geo team is doing. But if we can find uh, those specific kind of questions when it comes to treatments, uh, to give you an example, um, like um, if there is, actually I'm pretty bad at, at this uh, thing. Maybe you, Hillary, can formulate a question for a, a treatment type of uh, domain uh, that relates to quantitative data. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even if you just had like the percentage of people on a certain drug and you know what the outcome fall was, so like 40% lived and 60% died on this unrelated pharmaceutical or something. But okay. I guess so that, that sounds like a problem to me. Um, so we're talking about case reports specifically, not the general research article format. Both. I want both because they're, oh, they're publishing okay. a lot of data in these like unpeer-reviewed articles um, that are just like, oh, we, here's 128 patients and here's the data we gleaned out of it and here's our conclusions. But I think we can take that, those patient notes or those case studies and, and make some kind of congealed database where we might be able to pull trends. So I, I spent a little bit of time before this meeting going through the data set <laughs> and trying to uh, pull the 45,000 articles, as you said, and trying to pull things out. Um, what I'm finding is that articles that are classed as case reports specifically and things that are sort of like case report, um, there's not many of those. And there's especially not many of them with COVID-19, somewhere in the abstract. Um, I can send you some, some hard numbers on that, but I think it's without a, a broader definition, it's, it's going to be a little bit scarce. Yeah, and uh, like to to add to that, that's kind of like one of the primary steps of every task that we're approaching, just figuring out if there is enough data. And what was really helpful to us is thinking in in like expanding the query, right? So for there are two dimensions that we've expanded the queries uh, to. The first one is just extending the uh, the ways how the the article or paper is uh, written, so you know, case study, case report, and other ways to uh, name these things, or maybe other keywords that uh, would indicate that there is some uh, quant quantitative data about the, the outcomes. Uh, so that's one of the ways to extend it. And the other dimension that we've extended things in is expanding from just COVID-19 papers to coronavirus in general, that's one layer which greatly expanded the, the number of papers. And the second layer is actually expanding to all viral diseases. And again, this begs the assumption and uh, the question to domain experts, whether uh, the data at you know, expanded uh, level is you know, relevant enough, but at least it gives us some data to work with. Right. So I did, I did put together like a list of keywords that might help us filter out some of the papers to try to get the ones that have the info that we need. Um, I think I missed that. Is that on the Trello somewhere? No, I haven't posted it yet. I just posted oh, okay. it while I was listening to some really excruciatingly painful training at my day job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one can only can you send that in, in Slack? Yeah, yeah. Let me um, do that right. And Michael, okay. have you been exploring the raw Cord19 uh, on Kaggle or the enriched yeah. data set? Uh, so actually, I've only been, so far I've only been looking at the Cord19, but I do have the, the enriched one. I can start using that instead. Yeah, did so that increase the number of articles though, or did it just add more? It didn't increase the number of articles, but it greatly improved the quality of any kind of search problems because okay, I should, I should they enriched it, it with the UMLS a column and the uh, NER, the named entity recognition, and lots okay. of other metadata. I'll, I'll go through that and see if I get better numbers. Okay. So I think the first problem to solve is really perform this exploratory research uh, given the keywords that uh, Hillary provides and um, uh, trying to explore that in three dimensions. Just COVID-19, then all coronaviruses and like SARS, MERS, and, and relevant ones, and then going a step above and trying to hit all viral diseases. So this way, the output is just uh, three uh, kind of counts uh, of, of uh, what kind of data we, we have for each of those. Okay. Do you think that's possible to, 
Yeah. Um, when we're talking about this, though, in terms of the keywords, um, is the rule going to be that this keyword is used somewhere in the abstract or somewhere in the entire body of text or just the title? Uh, Let's ask Hillary. I have a, yeah. some. Uh, empirical evidence and experience, but let's ask uh, Hillary and John first. Sure. So that, I mean, one of the challenges about filtering these papers is traditionally in the background, you kind of give an overview of what the situation is and why my paper is important. And so yeah. if there was a way to exclude the background section, because you're going to get papers that are theoretical that talk about, oh, so many patients have died and they've been doing such and such on patients. And then it has nothing to do with people or people data. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I think we can actually do that. We've just, I think, finished the enrichment of the data set to properly uh, tag the sections because before we, the original data set has like thousands of section titles and we've mm -hmm. translated that into hundreds. So that okay. would probably help filter out the background stuff. Um, but that's in terms of filtering out where not to look for. And the question to Hillary, um, where does it typically occur? Um, I don't know if you heard John earlier, but he mentioned methods and results would be something else to say. I think the other thing. Well, okay. lots of attach keywords now to their papers also, right? For the yeah. most important things. So you can look at that. And if, if you just limit to the uh, methods and results or conclusion section of the papers, you get rid of all of that. Okay all from the background and anything that they're working with or discussing that is important is going to be mentioned in those sections. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That sounds great. A lot of the data that you'd want to look at for raw data extraction is going to be in some sort of appendix. Or supplemental table. Yeah. Supplemental table. Sometimes that's in line in a result when you can pull up a paper and sometimes mm -hmm. it's a separate document mm -hmm. through the link. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, I mean, let's, that's the first step. Let's figure out if there is enough data to do that. Uh, as a second step, let's figure out what formats does it typically occur for those. So basically, it's a filtering problem for right now. We're going to filter out papers that are relevant. Then we can uh, basically send you uh, a list of, I don't know, like what's manageable, like 20 for you to check out and kind of provide your uh, expertise on where the results, the, uh, the actual numbers are, and for us to, to understand how to extract those. Would it also be useful to consider negative filtering? I'm sorry, what? Uh, I think he means right. soft words. Um, word would exclude a paper. Is, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I can look at that. And what kind of Mm -hmm. uh, words would disqual uh, disqualify these uh, case yeah. studies and reports. We're going to have to look at this in particular, but I can give an example from something else. Um, I'm working on looking through about 20,000 different research papers on a different topic and uh, acronyms specifically. Some of those can be excluded because the acronym you're searching for has a completely different definition in another field or area. That's and then point. that's 100% accurate to filter those out, you're not going to lose anything. So he, here's what um, what we have. I think that UMLS enriching actually took care of that and bubbles up the acronyms and abbreviations into the high level uh, names and um, topics. That's an assumption that we've kind of observed with exploring the hydroxychloroquine um, keywords because HCQs and others uh, are basically not non-existent in the, UM, the UMLS column right now. They all bubble up to the general name. Good. But that's also an assumption, Michael. We sure we to check on that. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, it sounds like we just defined uh, the the problem and the next steps. And what to do. Um, yeah. It's just a matter of us actually doing it. I, I don't think, I'll have to look at the enriched data set. I don't think it will take very long for me to produce numbers and maybe, as you said, like samples of 20 or so. Yeah. Uh, things to actually check and see if they, if they work out. 
Sounds great. It, it sounds like we actually should create a Trello board at this point. I truthfully, when I created a Slack channel and when I saw that activity, I was hesitant whether to create a Trello board, but now it feels like a fully complete team that is just ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead, create a Trello board, and we'll, we'll try to streamline all the knowledge and I'll try to expose uh, this current team to other members in case anyone wants to join and provide some more input. Awesome. We actually got a physician um, today that really wanted to join risk factors team and I think he would be beneficial to this team too. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll figure out how, how to communicate that to him. Very cool. All right. Uh, anything else that you guys have in terms of exciting ideas or anything I can help facilitate? Uh, just a question. I know yesterday there was um, people brought up the idea of reaching out to a university researcher. I was wondering is for like the survey, does that idea still hold? Because I reached out to a couple of professors. I'm still waiting to hear back. Yeah, well, I think it's valid point. Like, let's assume that we get the right point of contact at CDC or any other place, we will have to present them something that makes sense in terms of survey, right? Not just saying, hey, we can create survey, but showing them, hey, this is the survey to use or, you know, a form or something. So I, I do think it's it's still relevant, right, Hillary? Yeah, yeah, I mean, if we get, if we get an academic contact and they have access to an investigational review board that basically checks all this stuff and make sure that we're gathering data ethically. I think that's useful. But again, IRBs not are notorious for being challenging to get through in a timely fashion. Um, so yes, something to pursue. And I think we'll just kind of ride it out and see, you know. Well, we could also ask them how to go about it without needing approval of an IRB. Yeah, that's, yeah. That might be the faster way to do it. Yeah. Do you want to create a Google Doc with just a list of questions, like starter questions or something, and Cam can help you uh, do that? Yeah, I don't know if I posted or not, but I think we had like rough, rough ideas at some point. Um, let me see if I... Can you throw a survey? Yeah. Yeah, I, I threw up something yes, oh, yeah. last night, just like rough ideas of the kind of questions we would want to ask to screen people. Oh, nice. On Trello board, I see. It. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So very like rough sketch, um, but just kind of the things we would be looking for to try to find the data on people who are not being hospitalized. And is this for, oh, that's for individual patients, right? Not for physicians. This would be more for individuals. So people who were told, uh, who, who didn't get admitted to a hospital, who were told by a physician, you, you're, you probably have this, you should go home. If it gets worse, report yourself to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so care, and that would depend on these individuals reporting their own information voluntarily. Are these going to be um, people that tested positive for coronavirus? Because you mentioned people that had coronavirus-like symptoms. Right. So people who either received a test and were positive and sent home, or people who their physician told them it's likely you have this, or we're diagnosing you as having this without the capacity for testing, or people who match the symptoms and are, I guess we can judge from the data set at that point whether or not they're likely to have this. Okay. okay. Well, this sounds easy and actionable. So maybe you and Cam can figure out a way to, you know, uh, finish, finish up that uh, survey, add like potential options for the answers and stuff like that. And then we can easily throw it to someone in communications team and you know get the ball rolling and actually create that yeah it would just be really good to have somebody who does this for a living look at it and make sure we're not overlooking something in the questions uh it could be disastrous if we throw this together without their input yeah i agree All right, uh, I think that makes sense so far. I think you, you guys are closing, uh, closing the mic microphone or something. You cut off for a second. 
Oh, I don't know. We were just saying that, yeah, we need to write the questions carefully. And I think Alka is going to help us with that um, this yeah. weekend. So make sure we get that. And I think she, she'll be free in two minutes. So maybe uh, let's, let's try to ping her here. Yeah, she says she's booked at three. Yeah, I think I already mentioned I followed up with CDC. Someone was going to ask about FDA. Does anyone have an FDA? Michael, did you manage? To oh, yes. Um, I wanted to, I haven't reached out to them yet. I wanted to get. I think this meeting has helped, but I wanted to get a clearer idea of like what the ask is specifically. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. If you want, I think I understand, but if you want to frame it in like a one sentence thing or something for me to. We can try. <laughs> okay. <so. laughs> That's what we all are doing, you know, just trying our best and somehow it, it produces results, which is amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that was everything that we had kind of come up with. Um, All right, sounds good. I, I'll i try to post the action items, notes, and create Trello board after the call and upload this call for any of the people that will be joining us. Cool. All right, Great. sounds good, guys. Thank you so Thank much. You. This, is, this is very exciting because this is one of the first tasks that didn't exist in the Kaggle challenge. And you know the the way it's forming and the speed is just amazing. So let's see what happens. Hopefully, this becomes a case study for all the future exciting ideas. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Good.